So we talk about visual strategy thinking. It doesn't have to be you drawing, and it doesn't have to be your management team drawing. You can work with visual thinking in many different ways. And some of you know this story that I will be telling. Some of you might not have heard it. But we're going to do a little storytelling around books. And what we have here is a framework that we call Strategic Innovation Canvas. And it's designed to help companies, small and large, think beyond the box, think beyond the current business model. Now, those of you who are standing all the way over here, you might want to come down this way a little bit. You'll see more. So on this axis, we have time. And what we see is that most companies, when they work with strategy, they are actually too short-sighted. They work with three years, four years, maybe five years. But to really be able to do significant long-term change, including like that car over there, you need to have, we would recommend, a 10 to 20-year perspective. Now, parts of Statoil, goes back to Christian's uh, question earlier, have really, really long-term ideas, strategies, business model sketches. Other parts, very short. We recommend that most companies stretch their timeline longer than they originally were thinking. Now, on the y-axis, we have the degree of fresh thinking, creativity, innovation, and the ability to execute change. So if you are completely mad and changing all the time, you're way up here. Going to Mars is the most natural thing in the world. We just haven't done it yet. You know, it makes perfect sense. So building the windows on these space things that go to Mars is the most natural thing in the world. We just haven't done it yet. If you're down here, well, you can kind of see how that's working out. Core business. This is our current core business. This is what we do today. And a lot of companies, they do operational excellence, they do lean, they do cost cutting, and they do all these things to basically just what we call defend and preserve the core. Newspapers in Norway, for instance, are world masters of you know, preserve <laughs> and defend. Here you have what we call the natural development. This is the logic improvement. It's the new services, new products, new markets that make sense. So you can do these in a very short-term perspective, or you can do it in a more long-term perspective. This is the playground. This is the more interesting stuff. This is what we call radical innovation. This is doing completely different, different as in products, services, countries, space programs, electric cars, stuff that doesn't exist stuff that for our organization is fundamentally different. And you could do it in a very short term or in a very long term. So you have to balance this portfolio. Now, a quick, quick story. The first company we'll start with is Amazon in yellow. Anybody know which year Amazon was founded? 1994 is correct. A very young man. He was just 30 and two days when he founded the incorporated company. He was too late to the internet. That was his idea. The internet was booming and in 1994 he was fearing for his life because he was too late to this gold mine thing. Well, he was kind of right, kind of wrong on this. But the first step is what is the level of ambitions, meaning where are we going? Now, Jeff Bezos said from day one, and you can actually read some of his first documents, we are going to be the world's greatest with amazing customer service. But he never explicitly talked about books. Books came a couple of weeks later when he had to answer the question, now what are we going to do? And what he figured out was that books was actually one of the easiest things you could sell online because the information is digitized, it's stored in big warehouses, and it's pretty easy to just ship it. So he moved himself, his car, his company to Seattle, just next to one of the big, big book warehouses, and he started selling books. And for a long time, Amazon was considered to be a bookstore, and some people still think it is. 1994, 1995, 1996, a small Norwegian company called Bookschilden also decided that selling books on the internet makes perfect sense. And they needed to have an ambition. What do you think their ambition was? What was the mind-blowingly amazing, oh my God, this is so cool ambition that they had? 1996. 
uh, we wish. Uh, they wanted to be, uh, notice the explicit uh, wording, they wanted to be one of the leading Norwegian online bookstores in Norwegian. I'm putting this here. And two weeks before they opened their online store, Haugen Book up on the coast opened. And then two days later, Book Shield opened. And boo, by definition, they were already one of the leading online bookstores in Norway, in Norwegian. And they started selling books. In 1997, in Norway, these two companies were more or less the same size in terms of trading volume, business volume. More or less the same size. Now, strategy on a fundamental level answers two questions. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? <coughs> now, already you can see where they were going or maybe not so much going. And Bookshilton kept selling books. And they were one of the leading. And then another company came and they were one of the top three leading online bookstore companies in Norway selling books. Now, go back to Amazon. If you're already selling books on Amazon, what is a logic improvement, a logic step for online sales? What makes sense? Sell something else. Sell something else. Like, you know, in retrospect, it does make perfect sense. And they quickly started selling CDs. CDs were the first next product category. And once you sell CDs, what else could you sell that's pretty similar? DVDs, yeah. Once Amazon realized that, ooh, we can actually sell stuff more than just books, they launched 34 different product categories, including selling cars, boats, like for personal fun, guns in certain states, wedding dresses, perfume, makeup, electronics, and houses, you know, the trailer houses where you actually have them delivered to your house and lifted with a crane into your house. Now, the car and the boat and the, and the house kind of messed up their logistics systems. So they scaled it down to about 19 different product types. And then they realized, ooh, we can sell a lot of stuff. They introduced more categories. They introduced what we call marketplace. But then they realized, they took a step back and they said, what are one of the core competencies that we have here. Now, uh, core competencies, by definition, is something you're really good at, that if you do more with it, it would be pretty nice. Something you're really good at. Well, what is something that Amazon's really good at here? Logistics is one, yeah. But really, it's really interesting, because they discovered this by accident, almost. It was not planned. You're close. Now, if you were designing by first principle, you would scale that down to what it's the very essence or what's the foundation of the second part of your answer. Yeah. Hits. Sorry? Hits. Hits on. Yeah. Now, when you, when you do look at core competencies, you want to really find what are one of the one, two, three things that we are extremely good at. What they realized, to be able to handle all this traffic, they had been adding a lot of servers. And they had been adding a lot of IT people because they needed the foundation to run all this stuff. So when they looked at their server park, they were like, ooh, we have a lot of capacity. And you, which uh, day of the year do you think is the most traffic on Amazon server? It's very close. It's the second most. It's the day before Christmas. So they had been forced to scale up for November, Black Friday, and December. But most of the year, they had tons of free capacity. So they said, ooh, what if we rent this out? What if we turn around and we launch this as our cloud service? And within a few months, Amazon became one of the top three servers providers worldwide. Now, what that means for, for us, uh, anybody here been infected by Angry Birds? Uh, we all know Angry Birds. It's a Finnish company, fantastic success stories. Their games, our problems, reside on Amazon server. Uh, IMD, the movie guiding thing, 
resides on Amazon's server. Interestingly, Amazon's biggest on the, uh, bookstore competitor called Barnes & Noble, they actually resided on Amazon's server because they couldn't figure out how to do it themselves for many years, so that's a different story. Amazon realized, ooh, we're really good at computers. So what happens if we add this stuff well, we get streaming, and Amazon, they're only doing this in the US. They, they're not allowed to do it in Europe. But they were big, one of the biggest streaming providers in terms of music and movies. Now, we know Netflix, but Amazon has the same level of content and a lot of originally produced stuff. So they started streaming, and then they said, well, we got this. Why don't we make our own ebook reader? It's known as the Kindle. Not the Norwegian book industry, they tried, but it's a different story. And once you have the Kindle, you have to fill it with software. So they started selling apps. And then they turn around and say, oh, this is pretty interesting. We are morphing into something very different than a bookstore, obviously. But we want to take this innovation thinking further. So if you look at this, and Amazon was getting better at what we call structured innovation. And disruptive innovation, and they were learning, and there are tons of good uh, articles on this, they were learning how to fuck up the competitors. And they looked at the books, and then they introduced direct publishing. What direct publishing means is you don't need to have a publishing company. You can go directly to Amazon. So if any of you guys are writing a book, you can upload it to Amazon, and Amazon will handle the sales, the marketing, the billing, and the production, and if you need it, the proofreading. They will do everything. And you can sell it as an ebook or as a paper book. They will print and ship for you. Now, what do you think most of the book industry said about that? <coughs> Won't work. Well, it did, sorry. <laughs> and it's not how we do things. Even less did they like the next one. Because in, in football, in soccer, we all know that one player plays for one team and he can't play it for several teams at the same time. So a club like Real Madrid, they will buy a player and he plays for Real Madrid. It's just how it's done. Well, that's not how it's done in the book industry until just now. Where Amazon... Aha, uh -huh, we're hiding. Said, we're going to start buying authors. We're going to buy Tom Clancy, J.K. Rawlings, and all of the young rising stars. So when they publish a book, they can only sell it on Amazon for three years. We'll pay them premium salary, but they are on our team. What do you think the book industry said then? That's not legal. That's not how we do it. It's not fair because you're so big. Well, they weren't really. And today there's a number of lawsuits against Amazon trying to defend the existing structure of the book industry. And then, of course, most recently, they launched this, Amazon Fresh. Amazon Fresh is Amazon online food, where they basically look at half of what people buy. It's food, groceries, and say, why can't we sell and deliver foods and food stuff as easily as we do books and CDs and DVDs? And then the answer was, well, of course we can. We just haven't done it yet. Today, Amazon has Amazon Fresh open in the greater Seattle area, launching in the greater LA area, and they're rolling out in most of the large, large cities in the US, including New York in 2014. Business Week had an article two weeks ago that said, 2014 is the year for online groceries. And then Walmart is racing to try to catch up. But of course, the problem for Walmart is that they have invested so much in the stores. They want, need, must have people to come in the stores. So they're fighting amongst themselves of their online strategy while Amazon is racing ahead. Today, when you look at Amazon, it is just behind Walmart, the world's second largest supermarket. By any metric, they'll pass Walmart in the next two to three years. And it used to be in 1997, an online bookstore by a young man called Jeff that wanted to sell books and something else. Now, go back to this little tiny Norwegian thing. During the same time period, because strategy gets really interesting when you compare to similar cases and you stretch it out over time. So, what, what's the uh, level of change at the Bookschilden at the same time, if any? 
what new products and services have they added? Because they have, in all fairness, they do have. They've added candles and blankets and nice items for your living room in a desperate attempt to sell you something else than just books. It's the same industry. At one stage in time, they were the same size, but they <laughs> chose different strategies. One had a very core business, core business, core business with a very limited scope, and the other one, <laughs> extremely ambitious, and as they were learning innovation, they became extremely disruptive. And today, you see what they've done. Now, interestingly, and this is really annoying. You know this young guy, Jeff Bezos? He used to live in Stavanger. He used to work as a summer intern for one of the uh, oil companies, ExxonMobil, while he was still in school. His parents was working here for uh, one of the large uh, uh, oil companies. And if history wanted it otherwise, he would have met a Norwegian blonde, had four kids, said Lintasta. And then the big question is, would Amazon have existed? Of course, a question to ponder for eternity. That's the introduction. Your job, go back to your groups, you'll find seven seven of these hanging around the uh, room on this side and that side. But we want you to pick one company. So that, for instance, you could pick uh, Capgemini, you could pick uh, Communicator 365, you could pick uh, Nolan, you could pick whichever company in your group, and try to work on this. Answering number one, what is the level of ambition in the company? Do you have an ambition that is extremely short-term and extremely anti-change? Or do you have a level of ambition that's further, meaning where are we going? And then the question is, how can you as a company develop going into this ambition? Focusing on the core business, improving whatever needs to be improved here, developing new logic things, but mostly interesting, how can you develop radical innovation? And then you'll see, some of you will end up with a result that looks something like this. That's all we could come up with. No, you're not. But the interesting thing is, how is this going to look when you map it out? This, for instance, would be typically Telenor's profile. Telenor is one of the best companies in Norway in terms of long-term innovation. They are incredibly good, especially in Asia. And they're able to balance short-term improvements, immediate innovation, medium-range innovation, and then long-term significant change. If you do this really fast, you'll be able to cycle through in about 10 to 15 minutes. If you're slow, you're going to use all of the 45 minutes we're giving you. We're going to have a clock that's counting down eventually. Holger will be working on the projector, and you have time to play and work, pick a company, and technically, ideally, you should be able to go through two or three cases. You have all the tools you need on your table, have fun.